Alejandro Ribeiro received the bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University de la Republica Oriental del Uruguay in 1998 and the master's and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Minnesota in 2005 and 2007. He joined the University of Pennsylvania in 2008 where he's currently professor of electrical and systems engineering. His research is in wireless autonomous networks, machine learning on network data and distributed collaborative learning. Papers co-authored by Dr. Ribeiro received the 2022 uh, IEEE Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award, the 2022 IEEE Brain, Brain Initiative Student Paper Award, Best Student, uh, a Student Paper Award, and 2021 Cambridge Ring uh, Publication of the Year Award, and the 2020 IEEE Signal Processing Society uh, Young Author Best Paper Award, and the uh, 2014 O. Hugo Shook Best Paper Award, and paper awards that um, several and yeah. several conferences, many conferences and workshops. His teaching has been recognized with the uh, 2017 Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching and the 2012 um, S. Reid Warren uh, Junior Award presented by Penn's undergraduate student body for outstanding teaching. He received an outstanding research award from Intel University Research Programs in 2019, a Penn Fellow class of 2015, a Fulbright Scholar class of 20, 2003, and a husband to Gabriela and father to Miranda, Guillermo, and Ariel. Alejandro, I'm really looking forward for your talk. Thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm sorry to all, all those of you that had to uh, uh, hear through uh, that uh, long list. So today I want to talk about constraint reinforcement learning. This is work we've been doing over the last uh, four or five years with uh, Miguel, Luis, uh, and Cynthia. <coughs> You know, let me begin with a, a, a statement of beliefs here. So I'm gonna talk about the systems engineering cycle or the engineering cycle, if you wish. You know, what do we do when we need to design a system? We specify requirements, we acquire data, we build a model, we <coughs> set operational settings. The reason why I do machine learning or artificial intelligence is because I think that learning has the potential to automate part of this cycle. And, you know, that's an emerging reality. I mean, this is a random list of successes going to, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, things like uh, autonomous driving, mole molecule molecular design, even soccer is being uh, impacted by uh, machine learning techniques. But, you know, not all is good in these emerging successes because, you know, uh, machine learning has serious shortcomings, right? So, I mean, we know that our AI systems produce solutions that are biased, unfair, and truthful. They are uh, not representative of our beliefs as a society in general. And if we go back to the engineering cycle, right, I mean, we should ask, okay, I mean, what is wrong with this picture? Well, and what is wrong with this picture, I think, has to do with the following. I mean, data we have, models we have, and optimization we have, right? So if you look at these four blocks, the block that is missing here is requirements. We don't really know how to handle requirements in machine learning. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, in a sense, the subject of this talk. I want to talk about the subject of learning and the requirements. So learning means finding a solution that fits data as best as possible, but learning under requirements means finding a solution that fits the data while being safe, robust, fair, representative, truthful, etc. And I think it's not unfair to argue that the inability to incorporate requirements is a major gap in the current practice of artificial intelligence. Now let me give you another reason why I care about uh, learning under requirements. So this is a cyber physical system. Without going into too many details, you know, uh, this is a group of uh, blue agents that I am trying to move around so that they uh, provide a communication network for uh, these red agents. And you know, this is a system that you can build with uh, standard techniques. You can also build it with machine learning techniques. And with, uh, you know, we've investigated both. But if you look at this system, right, again, this is a system that you cannot really uh, solve utilizing a standard learning techniques because in a standard learning, you just optimize for a single loss. And here, we want to satisfy requirements. When we design these networks, we have individual delay requirements, individual energy budgets, individual rate requirements, you know, motion constraints. We have aggregate energy requirements. So, you know, designing the system is really satisfying the requirements. I mean, the optimization is kind of like a the sherry on top of the cake, but the true cake, that's the satisfaction of the requirements. 
Now, without motivation, let me talk about how do we impose requirements, right? And yeah, you know, if you have studied any optimization theory at all, you know that we impose requirements through the use of constraints. And for that reason, I want today to talk about constraint reinforcement lag, which is exactly what you would expect it to be. We want to maximize the reward subject to a number of uh, rewards, or if you want to put it in mathematical terms, we want to find a policy pi that maximizes the accumulation of rewards that are zero subject to the accumulation of rewards ri to at least ci. And just to simplify notation, I'm going to introduce a vector for all of these uh, constraints. Now, this is a challenging problem, and the reason why this problem is challenging is because these value functions are not concave or not convex or not linear with respect to the policy. And I am showing you here an example. I'm not going to explain it, you know, but you look, uh, I didn't make a mistake here. These are the value functions for the problem that I am depicting here in the middle, and these functions are not concave, okay? But, you know, uh, challenges I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, in the next uh, uh, 30 minutes. Let me first uh, set aside this challenge for a moment and move into the Lagrangian dual domain, which in principle, I know I shouldn't be able to do, right? Because this problem is not concave. Nevertheless, let's forget about that. To move in the dual domain, well, what, that, what does that mean? We define a Lagrangian, right? That's a linear combination of objective plus constraints modulated by the uh, Lagrange multiplier. The dual function is the maximum of the Lagrangian, and the dual problem is the minimum of the dual function. Now you may wonder why do I want to move to the dual domain, and the reason for that is summarized here. If you look at the dual function, the dual function is an, a standard unconstrained reinforcement learning problem, okay? So if I move into the dual domain, I can use any policy optimization tool that I want. I just need to optimize over this reward R lambda, which is a linear combination of the rewards that I have in my problem. So that's the good reason for using this methodology. The not good reason for using this methodology is that, well, you know, we don't know that um, this is a good proxy because in general, dual maxima are a strict upper bounds of primal maxima. So we, we don't have a zero duality gap. Nevertheless, uh, you know, I can't try this out. I mean, this is, you know, a mathematical formulation of the uh, video I was showing you at the beginning. We want to maximize some rate subject to individual quality of service constraints and individual power budgets in uh, reinforcement learning language. That's how this problem is written because the performance metric here is the SINR, which you know is transforming to actual communication rates through some function that we observe from the environment. Okay, you know uh, I can go ahead solve this problem in the, in the dual domain, and this works well actually. So here I am showing you a couple of different parametrizations fully connected neural networks or graph neural networks. And what is remarkable here is that these learned policies, they do outperform a state of the art heuristics. This is not a one-off. Another example here, uh, this is a, a safe reinforcement learning. And what I am comparing here is a dual uh, solution against a reward shaping solution. And particularly when you look at uh, very high safety probabilities, like a three nines or four nines, there's a substantial advantage to the use of a policy that is learned in the dual domain. You know, which brings me, you know, I, 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 I could quit while I'm ahead, so this works, so end of the talk. But you know, as scientists that we are, we wonder why, okay? And, we, and, and probably you also want me to tell you a little bit about the how. So the why is this, right? I mean, why is it that we can solve these problems in the dual domain? Well, the answer to that is that even though they are non-convex, they do have duality gap. I'm gonna explain this in a minute. And the reason why this happens is because of a very interesting connection with formulations in occupancy measure space, which are linear programs. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know where I'm going with this. Now the how uh, is actually a little bit uh, more complicated. Uh, I am going to need to introduce a rather complicated solution methodology um, that is based on uh, the use of state augmentation. So uh, we will look at the details later on, but instead of operating directly on the MDP that is given to me, I will need to incorporate Lagrange multipliers to augment the state of the MDP. And finally, I want to talk briefly about um, a problem that I, I am kind of sweeping under the carpet, which is the fact that uh, specifying constraints is challenging, right? So it's difficult 
when you go into an unknown environment, you know, okay, I mean, is this level of constraint something that I can achieve, yes or no? Okay, and in order to um, overcome that potential limitation, we are going to introduce this notion of resilience, which is an adaptation of requirements that equates the marginal cost and benefits of relaxations. And again, these are all uh, titles. I just wanted to give you a preview before I dwell into the uh, technical details uh, of the talk. Now let me uh, begin then by talking about the strong duality of constraint reinforcement learning. That's one of the results that I told you I was going to cover. That's, that's the why, right? I mean, why is it that we can operate in the dual domain? So that's the theorem, uh, you know, as long as we have a strictly feasible point as a Slater's condition, uh, you know, the constraint reinforcement learning problem has zero duality gap. And that means that there's some sort of hidden convexity here. And that hidden convexity, of course, is in the occupancy measure reformulation. Uh, that's the occupancy measure. Uh, just for reference, by the way, guys, because if you don't know what it is, this slide doesn't make uh, much sense. But if you know what an occupancy measure is, that's what I'm doing here. If you don't know what an occupancy measure is, what is important for me to remark is the following. When rewritten in terms of occupancy measures, this problem becomes linear, okay? And that's interesting because of the following. Here I have this problem written in policy variables. It's non-convex. Here I have this other problem written in terms of occupancy measure variables. Well, this problem is linear. Being linear, it means that it has no duality gap. However, something that I have to remark is this. Primal equivalence, meaning these two problems are equivalent in the primal domain, doesn't imply dual equivalence, okay? Because constraint reinforcement learning with policy variables, that's still non-convex and that may still have a positive duality gap. Okay, so for all I know, this is what happens in the epigraph formulation of policy CRL. Okay, so here I have you know, my, uh, primal, uh, my, my primal epigraph, this is the primal optimum. You know, here I have the graphical representation of the dual function, so this is the dual optimum. There's a positive duality gap here. In occupancy measure variables, this doesn't happen because the epigraph is convex. It's actually a, a polytope, it's linear. Now, however, I know a little more here. I know that these two sets are the same, and if these two sets are the same, then uh, you know, the problem has to have no duality gap. However, and the reason why I am making you suffer through these plots is the following. These two sets are convex in very different ways, okay? This is the occupancy measure set, and I am looking here at the linear combination of uh, two policies, and what we know is because the problem is linear in occupancy measure space, a convex combination of policies produces a convex combination of value functions. This is not true in the case of the policy parametrization. When the problem is written in terms of policy variables, what I know is that there exists a P alpha that satisfies the convex combination. I know that the set is convex, but I cannot construct the convex combination by taking convex combinations of policies, okay? So this will be very relevant later on. I mean, this is the reason why my dual methods later on will, uh, you know, will take on a shape that is going to look a little uh, strange. By the way, I mean, uh, how do I build this P-alpha, right? I mean, if I need to build this P-alpha, I will get a, a pi and pi prime. Sorry, there's a typo here. Uh, pi and pi prime. I will construct rho and rho prime. I will now construct the linear combination. That will give me the P-alpha, right? But you know, uh, the P alpha is not, is not necessarily the, the convex combination of alpha and alpha prime. Now, uh, in practice, uh, we utilize learning parametrizations, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, this is the um, uh, problem written in uh, policy variables. It has no duality gap. I am now introducing a parametrization. Parametrizations typically are not convex, so I am now introducing again the duality gap. However, uh, you know, we can show the following, which is that if the parametrization is nu universal, then the duality gap of the parametrized problem is small, okay? And uh, the bound takes this form. Uh, the universality constant of the parametrization appears, uh, measured relative to the discount factor. 
And uh, what is most important here is the appearance of lambda star. So that's a measure of sensitivity. It's a measure of how difficult your constraints are, okay? So something, uh, parenthetical comment here, optimal dual variables, they offer very important information about the difficulty of satisfying constraints. Okay. Now, to summarize, what I've been uh, telling you in the last couple of minutes is the following. CRL problems are not convex when formulated in policy variables, even though they are convex in occupancy measure variables. And for that reason, I can show that they have uh, no duality gap, and that's because the epigraph set uh, are convex. Now, if we use new universal parametrizations, uh, you know, the CRL problems have ordered new duality gaps. Okay, now that was a little bit about the uh, why. Let me move on to talk about the how, and the how is in the form of uh, dual gradient descent. So how do we find solutions to these constraint reinforcement learning problems? Now, I have told you that the uh, duality gap is uh, small, is of order nu. That means that I can move into the parameterized dual domain, meaning I can define this uh, Lagrangian, take the maximum, gives me a dual function, I take the minimum, that gives me the uh, dual optimum. <coughs> now, in order to uh, define or to construct dual gradient descent, I'm so sorry about that, I am going to first find this theta dagger of lambda, which is the argument that uh, maximizes uh, uh, the Lagrangian. And as I have told you before, right, this is a problem that I like, or uh, that all of us should like, because that's just like a standard unconstrained RL problem. So you can do uh, whatever, uh, you know, policy method uh, you favor. You can utilize it here to solve this uh, unconstrained RL problem. The reason why I want to have these uh, Lagrangian maximizers, uh, which are uh, here, is because I know, uh, that's a well-known fact, that constraint slacks evaluated at Lagrangian maximizers yield uh, gradients of the dual function, which means that I can update lambda by evaluating the constraint slacks. And this is, again, something that uh, is not difficult because these are policy evaluations of, again, unconstrained RL problems. We have just one policy evaluation uh, for each constraint. And since the dual function is convex, which dual functions are always convex, I can apply, uh, I can conclude that dual gradient descent approaches lambda star, okay? In reality, uh, we don't really uh, minimize this Lagrangian. We do some kind of uh, primal policy opti optimization, and, you know, here I am writing policy gradients, but, you know, any policy optimization algorithm will work here. What is important is that this optimization algorithm will not be perfect, right? I mean, there's going to be a little bit of error, and what should worry you is whether these errors accumulate or not. The answer is no, they don't, and uh, if you have solutions theta dagger that are row approximate solutions of the Lagrangian maximization, uh, the um, iterates will converge to the primal optimum with two errors, one which I am uh, banishing a little bit because it's the same bound that we had before. This comes from the duality gap, but we also have this row that comes from the row approximate solution. But again, what is important here is that the errors don't accumulate. The other thing that is important in this slide is that what this uh, theorem is, is saying is that DGD iterates settled around the Lagrangian saddle, okay? You may be perhaps surprised to see that I am not writing anything about the optimization problem itself. I'm writing something about the Lagrangian, and that's for good reason. You know, this is how this algorithm works. Again, I'm going back to this uh, wireless optimization problem. And here, uh, you know, I have the objective compared with uh, other uh, existing heuristics, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing uh, as well, but, but that's because I'm imposing constraints. If I look at either the worst uh, user or the fifth percentile uh, of users, the performance is much better, and that's because I am favoring uh, disadvantaged customers so that they can receive a higher quality of service. So, you know, th this is the behavior that I wanted to induce in my system. Now, I want to offer you a closer look at how this converges, okay? So here I am showing you a plot of the multipliers as iterations progress, and here I am showing you a plot of policy iterates as iteration progress. And, you know, you see that this thing kind of settles on an oscillation, and because of the theorem that I presented to you before, we know that this oscillation is an oscillation in a neighborhood of the Lagrangian saddle, 
So that's good, you know, it means like we are solving the problem, or it looks like we are solving the problem. But if you have experience with dual methods, you know that this, there is a catch here, because this behavior in DGD does not necessarily imply convergence to primal variables, okay? Why that is, well, I'm gonna explain that in a minute. But when you see these plots, you should be concerned. And indeed, actually, I'm showing you here another plot, which is, I look at all of my constraints violation, and I pick the worst at each point in time. And this plot tells me that almost constantly, I am violating at least one constraint. Sometimes I satisfy all of them, but that's probably because my objective is uh, very bad, okay? So there's something fishy going on in here, okay? Which is that, yeah, you know, we settle into an equilibrium around the saddle, but, you know, we are not really solving the problem that we want to solve. And that brings me directly into a state augmented constraint reinforcement learning. So let me simplify the problem a little bit here by introducing the ergodic uh, reformulation. So instead of having discounts here, I just take a limit of the time average, okay? It's a minor variation of the previous problem. And again, I can represent this in vector form. For this problem, I can again define the Lagrangian. I can again define my uh, Lagrangian maximizers, and I can again write down my uh, dual gradient descent algorithm. I am choosing to write down a rollout dual descent in which instead of having um, the evaluation uh, here to infinity, I am evaluating to a certain time horizon T0. Okay, that's, uh, well, that's because uh, it's important in practice to uh, limit this T0, and I can do it and, and still uh, be able to prove convergence. Now, what I'm doing in this uh, rollout dual descent, therefore, is the following. I execute the policy pi dagger of lambda k, right, this is my lambda k, I execute pi dagger of lambda k for T0 time steps, and I accumulate the reward violations on the associated multipliers. Right, because these are constraint slacks, but with a minus, right? So the lambda is accumulating. The lambda is telling me how much I have violated my constraints up until this point in time. Okay, now this algorithm uh, can be shown to converge in the following sense, okay? It generates a sequence of state actions that is A, almost surely feasible, and B, near optimal, okay? And there's my conditions here that I, I'm not gonna bother you with them. Uh, so let me repeat, therefore, the sequence that this algorithm generates is A, almost surely feasible, and B, near optimal. And near optimal depends on the step size that I am using in the dual iteration. Okay, fair enough. You know, what this algorithm tells you is the following. The time average of the reward of the sequence generated by rollout, dual descent converges. And therefore, the sequence is a solution of the CRL problem. Actually, it's stronger because the constraints are satisfied almost surely. But why am I using quotes around solution? Well, because let me show you how this solution looks like. So this is a very important slide. Let me dwell on it for a little bit. These are constraints. These are dual variables, and these are policies. Let's for look at the first look at the policy. So this is why we are not converging. See how the, uh, you know, during this uh, red highlight, I am allocating all of the energy to uh, one particular user. In this blue highlight, I am allocating all of the energy to a different user. Over time, I am satisfying the constraints, right? But at each individual point in time are not. And this is exactly what is going on here when we look at the constraint slacks. So here we have the blue Lagrangian multiplier being, uh, sorry, the blue uh, constraint being violated while the red constraint is satisfied. In the next iteration, the red constraint is violated, the blue constraint is satisfied, and you see how they keep trading places. And that is being driven by the multipliers, okay? So the multipliers are oscillating. That induces the policy to switch, and the switch in the policy induces the constraints to be alternating between satisfaction and violation. Okay, so that's what I was telling you, that yeah, this algorithm kind of converges on average, but it doesn't converge at each particular point in time. The reason why I'm using quotes around the word solution is because I have no claim on the optimal policy P star. 
I know that I am generating policies that are samples of near optimal policies, but I am not claiming that I can find lambda uh, pi star. Right? And that's because, well, you know, look again at these plots, right? I mean, I cannot say, oh, I'm gonna stop the algorithm here at time uh, 32. Well, at time 32, you know, you're giving all of the resources to the blue customer. I cannot stop at time, uh, I don't know, 47. I am giving all the resources to customer, to the red customer. So what is going on in here? Well, actually, you know what is going on in here. I mean, what you want me to do is to take the time average of policies, right? But I can't take the time average of policies because V of pi is not convex, okay? So that's, I think, uh, one of the most uh, subtle messages here, okay? So yeah, you know, over time, I am solving the problem. But that's not what you want. You want the optimal policy. Well, for computing the optimal policy, you will need to take the time average of the policies, but you cannot take the time average of the policies because V of pi is not convex, okay? So there is no way in which I can recover a near optimal policy from the sequence of Lagrangian maximizing policies, and the reason for that, well, I mean, there's one way, of course, which is that I memorize all of the policies, but, you know, this is clearly impractical. Now let me try and explain this uh, a little bit better perhaps, or to summarize my comments. So this is the algorithm, right? So we do a policy maximization. We choose actions uh, according to this policy. We update the multiplier, okay? So this algorithm solves CRL in the sense that it generates a state action sequence that is almost truly feasible and nearly optimal. But this is not a statement that I would like to prove. I would like to tell you plainly, yeah, this is the optimal policy. I can't do that, okay? And that's the price of the non-concavity of the value functions, because if the value functions were convex, I could simply take the average of the policies and prove that the ergodic average of policies is feasible and order new optimal, but this is not true. All I can show is that the sequence itself is optimal. And that has like a very, uh, very interesting uh, consequence, guys, which is that, yeah, I want to learn how to solve this constraint reinforcement learning problem, but I don't know how to solve that. I change the problem a little bit, and what I need to do is I need to learn how to maximize the Lagrangian, okay? What I am claiming this is the following. So I solve constraint reinforcement learning if I can solve this Lagrangian maximization problem. Why? Well, let's, let's see how, or, or uh, I shouldn't say why, I mean how. Let's see how. Well, you know, this is your MDP. Uh, you know, uh, you would like to learn this policy by a star and be done with it. I'm telling you, I don't know how to do that. I am, however, going to learn this Lagrangian maximizing policy and I will execute it. In order to do that, I need the Lagrange multiplier. If I need the Lagrange multiplier, well, I need the lambda update. And what I am doing here is actually augmenting my states. Instead of considering an MDP defi defined by ST, I consider an MDP defined by ST and lambda T. And, you know, the environment takes care of this update. I need to take care of the multiplier update. So I have this, you know, not only an augmented state, but also an augmented transition probability curve. Now, in practice, by the way, right, so, you know, uh, the policies are functions of learning parametrization, so, you know, I am not going to actually learn uh, this individual uh, Lagrangian minimizing policy, uh, maximizing policies, I am going to learn a policy that uh, maximizes over a certain parametrization the constraint reinforcement learning over a particular distribution on the Lagrange multipliers. And, you know, I have augment, augmented the states here, so notice that the selection of this uh, blue probability distribution for the Lagrange multipliers has the same challenges that you would expect for any off-policy reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, this is how things uh, would look like in this parameterized case, right? It's the same plot as before, except that now, uh, you know, instead of executing uh, that uh, policy pi of lambda k, I am executing this policy pi sub phi, where phi is the parameterization that solves this uh, optimization, uh, sorry, this uh, reinforcement learning problem. And again, right, observe how this reinforcement learning problem is a standard uh, reinforcement learning problem without constraints uh, whatsoever. And, you know, well, uh, I've shown you all of these plots before, so th this al algorithm works, the constraints are satisfied, 
on average, the objective is minimized on average. And yeah, you know, I still have policy switching, but that doesn't matter because I am solving the problem over time. Okay, uh, you know, I'm uh, close to be done here. I want to take uh, 10 more minutes of your time if you will allow me. And in this, uh, you know, remaining 10 minutes, I'm gonna give you uh, five minutes on this idea of resilience. So resilience, uh, well, perhaps I need to tell you what I mean by resilience. So in, ecolo in ecology, resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to adapt the function to withstand varying conditions. We are calling this resilient uh, constraint learning because we are adapting specifications to accommodate varying data properties. So we are playing this analogy here. But that, that's just to explain the name resilience. I mean, but let me tell you what the challenge is. Now, uh, specifications are difficult. I mean, they're difficult in learning because we are supposed to not know the environment, right? So, you know, uh, what are the distributions? I mean, what is the transition kernel? I don't know that. So how can I warranty that my specifications CI are feasible? Well, in reality, as an engineer, these constraints are part of design, right? I mean, you say, well, you know, I, you know, I, uh, I want a Ferrari for $5. Well, that's an infeasible problem, right? So we negotiate on the quality of the car or the price that we are willing to pay. So in practice, constraints are variables, but you know, I am trying to replace the engineer to some extent, so how do I replace the systems engineering of the constraints itself? Well, let's introduce a relaxation, and let me point out, right, that a relaxation is beneficial because it increases, sorry, that's a typo, it increases the, the objective uh, reward here. But it is costly because it decreases, it increases the, specific, the, the specification violation. Okay, so I need to balance these two things. And my proposal is the following. I am going to balance the cost and benefits of relaxations by introducing a cost to measure the cost of that relaxation and settling for an equilibrium in which the marginal cost of the relaxation and the marginal benefit of the relaxation equate. This is like a good, a good equilibrium to achieve, people, because uh, what I am saying here is that I am going to relax my constraints in proportion to how difficult it is for me to satisfy them. Uh, or to put it in better terms, right, these are the curves of the perturbation function. This is the a particular curve for the, uh, uh, for the marginal cost of relaxation. And you know, when the const as the constraints become more difficult, which is as this curve shifts to, uh, to my right, which is also uh, your right, the relaxation becomes By the way, I told you that uh, Lagrange multipliers carry important information about the problem, and those of you that know optimization theory, you know that this uh, derivative is precisely the optimal Lagrange multiplier, and that actually tells you something that is interesting here, because you know the Lagrange multiplier here controls the complexity of the problem in a sense. Remember that appeared in our bounds, so you know, like uh, when I am introducing this relaxation, I am settling for problems that in a sense are also easier to solve. Algorithmically speaking, uh, this is actually very simple. You just need to, uh, you know, consider this optimization. Oh, I believe I have eight minutes. Yeah, I have 11 minutes, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, what I was saying is that algorithmically, uh, we don't need to compute this equilibrium explicitly. We just need to introduce this uh, reformulation. Now, uh, as an example here, let me talk about a problem that's actually not a reinforcement learning. I'm talking about federated learning with class imbalance here. So, you know, we want to design, uh, we want to collaborate to learn a classifier, but some of us have imbalanced data. You know, I, I, I speak English with an accent, so my, um, my data set is a little different uh, than yours. Uh, that can be uh, written in terms of constraints, right? We say, well, let's find a classifier that is good for all of us, but I'm not willing to pay too high of a price to, uh, you know, I'm not willing to pay too high of a price to uh, collaborate with the group. Now that's a problem that we can solve by utilizing resilience, and what I want you to focus on is on this plot in which I am looking at Customers with more class imbalance, these are the customers that are, whose constraints are more difficult to satisfy, and indeed, the algorithm is 
relaxing the constraints in proportion to their difficulty. And I also wanted to show you this plot of a statistical generalization in which I am uh, showing to you the, um, the uh, behavior of the constraints during training and testing. So you see how during training, the, uh, you know, the behaviors of the two algorithms are similar, but during testing, the behavior of resilient constraint learning is better. And that's because uh, um, in reducing the Lagrange multipliers, I relax my constraints, but I also end up with better statistical generalization properties. And that is all I wanted to say, except for uh, a few minutes of concluding remarks. If I can be indulged, uh, you know, I, I do believe on this. I think that, uh, you know, machine learning will prove most transformative once we start utilizing it uh, in, uh, in systems engineering, once we start utilizing machine learning and artificial intelligence in engineering tasks. You know, it's, 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 it's all good with uh, language and images, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, language and images, they have relatively limited economic value, right? I mean, like uh, the things that we build are the ones where uh, the economy thrives. And I also uh, believe, actually, I don't, I don't see how you can do artificial intelligence in engineer systems without incorporating requirements. Uh, that's my philosophy. Today I talk about constraint reinforcement learning. That's exactly what you think it is. It's difficult because your policies are not concave. And however, it does work. I mean, I show you plots for wireless communications. I showed you plots for safety. In both of these cases, constraint reinforcement learning does better than existing alternatives. I presented to you three results. Result number one is on a strong duality. Result number two is that in order to solve these CRL problems, these constraint reinforcement learning problems, we necessitate a state augmentation, okay? So we cannot just run a standard primal dual methods. We need to, or if you wish, we do, you know? We, we, we run these standard primal dual methods. However, the interpretation of the algorithm is a little tricky, okay? It's not just that you can train and find the optimal policy. You will never find the optimal policy. You need to run the algorithm itself. And that changes things quite a lot because instead of learning to solve the problem, you need to learn to maximize Lagrangians, okay? If you don't remember anything from this talk, if I was a bad teacher and, I, and you did not understand anything that I said, well, remember this, which is that in order to solve these constraint reinforcement learning problems, we need to learn to maximize the Lagrangian as opposed to learning to find the optimal policy. I finally introduced this uh, notion of uh, resilience in which we are equating the marginal cost and benefits of constraint uh, relaxations. Now, just if you allow me a little bit of uh, marketing here, you know, I talk about constraint reinforcement learning. You can also do constraint supervised learning. Uh, we have work on that as well. So these are papers on statistical generalization. And if you like what I said, and you happen to be going to L4DC, which I know that a few of you are going. We are giving a tutorial uh, which will cover this talk and also our work on um, uh, supervised uh, learning. So we'll be talking there on July 15. And uh, that is all. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for the wonderful talk. Uh, any questions? We have time for a couple. A great talk. So uh, not just in the algorithm, but also in the initial formulation, you have this kind of on average constraint where you could be in a very dangerous state kind of uh, infrequently, right? Yeah, just with the sum. And uh, I'm wondering kind of what sorts of systems you have in mind where this is a kind of a fair thing versus which uh, maybe things you have in mind where you wouldn't want to formulate it this way. Yeah, so you, you're talking specifically about safety or? Things like that, yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, the, 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 the specific problems that I have in mind are actually very simple. I, 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 you know, I'm a systems engineer. I, I, I work a lot with cyber physical systems. In like a, the wireless communication systems that I was showing you, I have like, a, you know, I'm serving like 100 different customers. So all of these 100 different customers have to be served. I cannot serve them on average. So I, I, I do have a bunch of constraints emerging naturally. In, um, 
in safety formulations, what you are calling out is the following, right? So here we are saying, oh, we are safe on average, right? And that is still, you know, there's one way of being safe, which is the following. I am going to be very safe 99% of the time and very mm -hmm. unsafe 1% uh, of the time, right? And this, and this constraint is not prevented that from happening. So if you are th thinking in terms of safety, there is an argument to be made about whether this is the right constraint to impose or not. Now, uh, on, the, on, on the, the constraint that you want to impose is, is different, actually. You would like to say, I want to be safe for all t, right? Which means that what you want is to make this constraint, you know, safety is, is negative, right? I mean, you would want to make this constraint less than zero, meaning I never violate the constraint. But okay, I mean, if you make the, that less than zero, then, you know, this problem has an empty interior, it becomes difficult to solve, et cetera. So I don't really think that safety has been well solved in reinforcement learning yet, partly because the kind of constraints that you want to impose, which are instantaneous constraints, are much more difficult to handle. Thanks. Yeah, Alec. Yeah, the, the other place in reinforcement learning where state augmentation is very common is when you have partial observability, because then it's like, okay, maybe uh -huh. you get yeah. one state vector, but some of its entries are masked or something. So I'm just wondering, like, is there any reinterpretation of the state augmentation as somehow related to partial observability or like maybe yeah, your yeah. reward, your cumulative return is telling you one thing, but in actuality it should be telling you something different? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, there is. The, you know, the, first off, I mean, just to clarify what the fundamental problem is, this is what you would like, okay? You would like to find the policy pi star of ST. Uh, that, that, that policy is difficult to find. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I don't want to say that we, okay, but I don't know how to find this pi star in general. And uh, I, I, I should warn here that I've, I've seen papers that claim to find pi star, pi star of t. Uh, th these papers, for the most part, the ones that I've read are wrong. Um, you will excuse me if you are one of the authors because they make the argument that the value function is linear. The value function is not linear with respect to the policy. Uh, for that reason, we need to do something else, which is we need to maximize the Lagrangian, and then we execute the policy that optimizes the Lagrangian. Now, you, you ask me, okay, is this related to partial observability? Yes, it is, because when you optimize the Lagrangian, you need to know how much you have violated your constraints in the past. Uh, now, interestingly, you don't need to memorize the trajectory of your constraints, you just need to memorize an aggregate. So in a sense, uh, you know, the partial observability interpretation is the following. This lambda k is a sufficient statistic for your constraint violations. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing the insights. Really interesting. And um, I'm just curious about the constraint because I, I feel like in a lot of engineering uh, setup, the constraint should be uh, a function of s. Right, maybe we have a constraint that, because state is what we can observe, but I find the constraint format in your formulation is a little bit different, so can you have some comment on this? Well, so the, the you know, this, this reward here, right, is a function of the, 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 the reward here is a function of the state, right? So here, here you could say, you know, like, a, my reward is if you visit this state, my reward is minus 100, okay? So, the, the, so in that sense, I'm not sure I'm getting your question. What I think your question is related is, is the following. I mean, sometimes you want your constraint to be, I don't want to visit this state period, okay? Okay, so two things I can tell you. The mathematically, in this formulation, what you want would be to say, well, the reward when you visit this state is minus infinity, okay? And in that case, yeah, you know, like uh, you would learn not to visit that state. Make sense? Now, I am, uh, I am, of course, saying this facetiously because, you know, minus infinity is a concept. It's not an actual number. So you cannot really say this thing is minus infinity. 
Okay, so I cannot really, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can approximate safety. I cannot truly formulate safety with this, uh, with this formulation. Um, and that's uh, actually something that I was that, that I was telling you before. I mean, like, uh, if you know, if there is a state that you don't want to visit, almost all of the safety work that I've seen is somehow relaxed to some. Uh, to some time average of not visiting that state because the constraint of not going somewhere ever, that's very difficult to impose. It's not very difficult to impose, sorry. It's very difficult to, it's very difficult to learn. Yeah. Which, which, by the way, I mean, you can see, right, because if I put a minus infinity here, that means I'm making the problem very difficult, right? So it's not, it's not that we can't do it mathematically, it's that when we sit down to write down a machine learning algorithm to learn that behavior, it, will, it, it never converges well. If you saw my plots, you know, I have three nines or four nines, I don't have six nines, which is what I would like to have because learning six nines is very difficult. 